So pleased to welcome you all here this morning as we gather for the morning worship of the Ashford Reformed Baptist Fellowship. I'm particularly pleased to welcome amongst us Pastor Roland Burroughs from the West Midlands who will be ministering the Word of God to us each at the latter part of our worship this morning. But now let's come to the Lord in prayer. Let us seek his help and blessing upon our time together. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we come into thy very presence in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we pray that upon this Lord's Day morning, thou would presence thyself with us in mighty power. O oh Lord, remove every distraction from our hearts and lives and cause us to seek thee in utmost sincerity. Draw close to us, we pray. Bless us each, we ask. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We turn now to our first hymn this morning from the Blue Young People's Hymn Book. Our first hymn is Come, Let Us Join Our Cheerful Songs with Angels Round the Throne. Number six, Come, Let Us Join Our Cheerful Songs. Turn now to our Bible reading which comes from the letter of Paul to Philemon and our Sunday School letter lesson shortly will be from something from this book about an individual by the name of Onesimus. But we're going to read from this letter of Paul to Philemon. If you have one of the red presentation Bibles that we've given to you, you'll find this in the New Testament on page 243. The letter of Paul to Philemon, and we're going to read from verse 10 down to verse 22. Paul writes in this letter, in verse 10, I beseech thee for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten in my bonds, which in time past was to thee unprofitable, but now profitable to thee and to me, whom I have sent again, Thou therefore receive him, that is, mine own bowels, whom I would have retained with me, that in thy stead he might have ministered unto me in the bonds of the gospel. But without thy mind would I do nothing, that thy benefit should not be as it were of necessity, but willingly, for perhaps he therefore departed for a season, that thou shouldest receive him for ever." not now as a servant, but above a servant, a brother beloved, specially to me, but how much more unto thee, both in the flesh and in the Lord. If thou count me therefore a partner, receive him as myself. If he hath wronged thee, or oweth thee aught, put that on mine account. 
I, Paul, have written it with mine own hand. I will repay it. Albeit I do not say to thee how thou oughtest, how thou owest unto me even thine own self besides. Yea, brother, let me have the joy of thee in the Lord. Refresh my bowels in the Lord. Having confidence in thy obedience, I wrote unto thee, knowing that thou wilt also do more than I say. But withal, prepare me also a lodging, for I trust that through your prayers I shall be given unto you. May God truly bless to us that reading of his holy word. And now let's turn to the Lord in prayer. Let's join our hearts together in the words of the Lord's Prayer and I will then lead you all in prayer. Let us all pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory for ever and ever. Amen. Almighty God, our loving and gracious Father, we praise thee, Lord God, for the Lord Jesus Christ, who even now is at thy right hand. We thank thee for his completed work when he came to this earth and led that perfect life and then died upon the cross of Calvary. We thank thee that even now he is at thy right hand as the high priest of his people, interceding for them, praying for them. We thank thee, Lord, that when we come to God through him, we can be certain that thou will receive us. Oh Lord God, as we come, we praise and bless thee for all that thou hast given to us. We thank thee, Lord, for the many earthly blessings we enjoy. We thank thee, Lord, for preserving us to this time. We look upon our lives and know that thou hast given us so very much for our homes, for food and clothing, security. We thank thee for those who have work. We praise thee, Lord, for education. And, O oh Lord, we know that at this time it has been a very difficult time for so many. O oh Lord, we think of how the schools, for the most part, are, uh, are shut to most pupils. We know, Lord God, that um, most people are uh, not able to go out to work, and yet we thank thee that thou hast given us so very much. And, Lord, we know that in a time like this, when many things have been taken from us, yet we praise thee, Lord, that this is a reminder that so often we have enjoyed so very much. As we come, Lord God, we praise thee for the freedoms we have. We thank thee, Lord, for the opportunity to gather in this way. Lord, we know that, that the COVID situation has caused so many difficulties, but we praise thee for the technology that enables us to meet online. We pray, Lord God, that as we hear thy word, that thou would take it. We thank thee, Lord, that although we're not gathered together in person, Yet we praise thee that God the Holy Spirit is not limited to uh, gathering together in the normal ways. But we thank thee that what we can hear from thy word may be applied by God the Holy Spirit to each one wherever we are. Bless each family, bless each young person, bless each parent, each older person. In all our situations, help us we pray. We pray, Lord God, that they would truly give us this day our daily bread and we would look to thee for earthly provision, for help in this life, for, the, for what we need from day to day. We wouldn't be those who think that we can cope alone, that, that we're independent of God. No, Lord, we depend upon thee every for, every, for every breath of, that we breathe, every moment of every day. But, Lord, as we come, we wouldn't be simply those who look to thee for earthly blessings. We pray, Lord God, that most of all, that we might look to thee to be our saviour, we might remember that thou art our great God, the one before whom we will one day stand, the one to whom we will give an account. We pray, Lord God, that we might be ready for that great day and that we might come to seek thee for salvation, for pardon, in the way in which thou hast provided it in the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, open up our hearts and our minds. We thank thee, Lord, that thy word teaches us in so many varied ways so many different portions of scripture, so many different approaches to spiritual truths. And yet, Lord God, we know that there is but one central message 
of the fact that we are creatures made by God, the fact that we are fallen, the fact that we are sinners, the fact that we are guilty, and that one day, if we are uh, if we're not ready, we will have to stand before thee unprepared to bear the punishment for our sins. And yet we thank thee that thy word makes so plain that thou art a God who provides salvation, who offers to us freely a way of escape, a way of pardon, a way of reconciliation, a way whereby we may be brought to peace with God. Oh Lord, we pray that each one of us might see the great joy of the gospel. Oh Lord, we pray that we might look to the Lord Jesus Christ and be amazed, overwhelmed, astounded at what he's done. Oh Lord, we know that so many of us have heard these truths many times and yet we know that we can become so used to what the Bible teaches that we become unduly familiar with the amazing message of thy word. O oh Lord, we pray that thou would remove that hardness, that undue familiarity. Open up our eyes, we pray. Bless us each, we ask. Help those who teach thy word this morning. Help those who listen. O oh Lord, we pray that this might be a time when we would truly meet with God. Bless each, we pray, and do us good. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We come now to our next hymn from the Blue Young People's Hymn Book, number 25. Come every thankful heart that loves the Saviour's name. Number 25, following which we'll have the talk to the young people. But first of all, number 25, come every thankful heart. Today for our short item we're continuing looking at the books of the New Testament. We've thought about the Gospels and then Acts, Romans and today we're coming on to the next epistle. Remember an epistle is a letter. This letter is the letter that Paul the Apostle wrote to the people in Corinth and it's called 
1 Corinthians, the Epistle to the Corinthians. You'll find it in your Bible after Romans. And this letter is quite a long letter that Paul wrote round about 57 years after the Lord Jesus Christ was born. Now you'll remember that Paul travelled to many different places and this letter was written to the Christians who lived in a place called Corinth in Greece. If you look at the map that we can see here, Paul travelled to many different places and at the end of his second missionary journey, he travelled to Corinth. And in Corinth, there were people there who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul had to teach them many things. And he wrote this letter to teach the believers about Jesus, about what the Lord Jesus Christ had done for them and his life and his resurrection and also what how they ought to live as a consequence of believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Because the Bible teaches us that if we believe in the Lord Jesus to be our Saviour, that that should affect the way that we live. So Corinth was in Greece. And in Corinth there were many different temples to different gods. And the people in Corinth didn't live according to Ten Commandments. In Corinth there were many people who lived very sinful lives. And the word Corinthian often applied to people who lived sinful lives. And Paul had gone to Corinth to teach people there about the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul had preached in Corinth and the people there had been baptised and believed. They had believed the gospel that the Lord Jesus Christ was the Saviour. And after they had believed they were baptised. And they were baptised to show their true belief in the Lord Jesus Christ. And these people, before they became Christians, knew very little about the Lord Jesus Christ and knew very little about the teaching in the Bible. And Paul and the other fellow people, Apollos and other people who were with him, taught those people much about the Lord Jesus Christ. And in this letter, Paul also spoke to the Corinthians. The church of Corinth quarreled about which preacher they liked most. Some said, oh, I like Apollos the most. And some said, oh, I like Silas more. And some people said, oh, I like Paul the most. Well, Paul wrote to the Corinthians and told them that they were focusing on the wrong things. Paul told them that instead of focusing on which preacher they liked the most, that they should focus on the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the teaching of the Lord Jesus Christ was so much more important than the people. So in the book of 1 Corinthians, there's much important teaching. You'll see in the picture here that I've listed the different chapters where we can read this. And maybe during the week, you'll want to read some of these chapters to learn more about the teachings. We learn that wisdom is a gift from God. We learn that no one is more than important than another person. In the Christian church, each person is equally important before God. We learn as well about what Christian marriage is like and how God has blessed Christian marriage. And then in the book of 1 Corinthians we have more teaching. We learn about the Lord's Supper, how God uses this to remind Christian people about the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Remember on the night before Jesus died that he took bread and took wine and he broke the bread and said this is my body which is broken for you and he took the wine and he said, drink this in remembrance of me. And Paul taught the people in Corinth how the breaking of bread and the drinking of wine was to remind them of the death of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Paul also wrote to them about spiritual gifts, how believers have gifts which are used for the church, whether that's gifts of things like helps or some people are gifted to preach and other things like that, that there's something that each of us can do in the service of God. And Paul also wrote to say how the church is like a body, how each different member in a church has a very important part to play and how we should each play the part God has given us so that the body is fit together and functioning correctly. Also, the book of 1 Corinthians contains a very famous chapter about love. This chapter is often read at weddings. It tells us how love is patient, love is kind, Love, love suffers, it suffers long. And this chapter is a very important chapter to tell us how we should love other people 
and how we should love the Lord God. So the book of 1 Corinthians has much teaching in it. As we go through the book of Corinthians, if we come to chapter 15, we see there that Paul spends a long time talking about the importance of the resurrection and how as Jesus died on the cross and then was buried and then rose again, so Christian people, when they die at the end of this life, their body is buried, but one day when Jesus comes again, their body will be raised with the Lord Jesus. And the teaching of the resurrection is very important to Christian people. Paul also teaches about how people should give to the work of the Lord and that's also included in this epistle and also again about the way of love. So this epistle has much important teaching in it and at the end of the epistle Paul writes these very important words. He says, watch, stand fast in the faith. That means be strong in your faith. Quick you light men, be strong. Be strong in your faith. Don't doubt what you believe about God and about the resurrection and about the way of truth. But then he says some other words that are really important as well. Let all things be done with love. Let's think about that today. God sent the Lord Jesus Christ because he so loved the world. He sent him so that we might have our sins forgiven. And then once we have our sins forgiven, God wants us to walk in his ways. He wants us to walk in the ways of love, the ways that please him. So think about that this week. I hope you'll read your Bibles each day and I hope you'll read through this epistle of 1 Corinthians and ask God to help you to understand more of his truth. Thank you. Thank you so much for that talk for the young people. In a moment we will of course have our Sunday School lesson but first of all we'll have our next hymn which is 126 from the Blue Young People's Hymn Book. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Oh, the grace that brought it down to man. Oh, the mighty gulf that God did span. At Calvary, 126. Oh, the love that drew salvation's plan. Now today, we're going to learn about a letter. Have you had a letter come in the post? And on the front of your letter will be your name. There's a name on this letter. This is addressed to somebody called Philemon, who lives in Colossae in Asia Minor. It's his letter we're going to learn about today. Now, if your letter comes through the post, it will have a stamp. But sometimes letters come through your door because somebody has delivered them. And this letter is delivered by somebody called Onesimus. So who was Philemon? And who was Onesimus? And who wrote the letter? Or well, sometimes if you've had a letter and it's come maybe from a different country, as this letter came from a different country, on the back it might tell you who it's from. 
And this letter that we're going to learn about is from Saul, uh, sorry, from Paul, who was once called Saul. Well, we know who Paul is. We've been learning about Paul in Sunday school. But who is Philemon? And who is Onesimus? And what's inside? Well, you have to open your letter. Let's open the letter. And inside is the letter we're going to learn about. And it starts off with who it's from. And it's from Paul. We've known about Paul. And it says, Paul's a prisoner. Paul is a prisoner. Well, what happened? Why was this letter written? Let's start at the beginning. It's always a good place to start. But Anismus was a slave. Now, slavery is not right, but it has happened in history over time. And even sadly, today in parts of this world, there are people who are kept against their will. And the Bible is very clear that slavery is wrong. But Onesimus was a slave and his master was Philemon. And they lived in a town called Colossae. But we know that Philemon had changed. At some point in the past, Paul had been in that area and had been preaching. And Philemon had heard about the Lord Jesus. And Philemon had trusted in the Lord Jesus through what Paul had preached. Well, Onesimus would have known that. Onesimus would have known that his master had changed. Maybe Philemon before was really tough. And if um, Onesimus got the slightest thing wrong, he would tell him off, maybe even hit him and hurt him. But now he became a Christian. Philemon would have changed what happened in the house. Maybe once a day, Philemon would call everybody, all the servants, all his family together, and he would read parts of the Bible to them and explain it to them. Maybe they sang. And Onesimus hmm, didn't like it at all. So Onesimus decided he was going to run away. It wasn't right to run away. Maybe it was actually slightly easier to run away, given that Philemon was now a Christian. So what happened was Onesimus was a runaway slave. And he wanted to be free. He wanted to be free. We can understand that. And he ran away and he thought, I'm going to go to the best place in the world. He thought, I'm going to be, I'm going to make my money. I'm going to be successful. I'm going to be the best you can possibly have. I'm going to go to the capital of the Roman Empire. I'm going to go to Rome itself. Rome was where everything was happening at that point in time. It was the place to go to. So the question we've got really is how comes this runaway slave got to visit Paul, a prisoner? Well, Onesimus had high hopes that in Rome he was going to have a good time, he was going to make his money, he was going to become famous. Or life was going to be good. You know, we can feel that. We can think, well, when I get older, I'm going to do what I want, I'm going to go where I want, I'm going to be what I want. And the world promises all sorts of things. But the world might promise, but it doesn't give. It won't make you happy. And in fact, sadly, people will try and take advantage of you. And they might promise all sorts of things, but they're not going to give you true happiness in life. What did Onesimus find? Well, he found only trouble. You know, maybe as a runaway slave, it wasn't easy. Maybe he had to steal and lie and fight in ways to survive. And it was at some point, we don't really know the details, when he was in Rome, in a sense, well, he came to his senses. He suddenly thought, this is wrong, this is crazy. When I was back home with Philemon, even though I was a slave, I was in a much better position than I am now. 
And somehow Onesimus found out that Paul was a prisoner in Rome. Maybe he had known that before he had run away from Philemon because Philemon would have kept up to date with what was happening with Paul. And maybe Onesimus knew that somewhere in Rome was Paul a prisoner. And Paul was kept in his house as a prisoner, but he could have people come and visit him. So he went and met with Paul. And he listened to what Paul had to say. And he listened to the words that Paul taught him about the things of God. And this was new that what Paul said about the Lord God is right. And and this was new that what Paul taught, the fact that we are guilty, that we're full of sin, however hard we try, we can't make ourselves right with God by ourselves. That however hard we think that we can be a success in life, that if we're without God, there's no purpose. Because we are made by God for God to love him and serve him and put him first. And in this really in the sense of being fighting against believing in the Lord God. He he wanted to believe what the world had offered would, would satisfy him, but it hadn't. And Anismus therefore realised that the only thing he could do was to trust in the Lord God for forgiveness. Well, Paul, who was an older man by now, treated Anismus as if he was his son. Anismus was changed. You know, Anismus had been, you at one level useless to his master. He had run away, he was no good, but now he was being so useful for Paul. He helped him in his work. He got things for him. He was such a help to him. But Paul and Onesimus knew that things weren't going to be properly right until Onesimus went home and talked to Philemon because actually he had run away from Philemon. And he needed to go back to see Philemon. Because that was what was right under the law in those days. So Paul said to Onesimus, I will write a letter. I will write the letter to Philemon and you're going to take it. So when you get there, Philemon can read the letter for me and he can see what it says. And so that's what happened. Paul wrote this letter that we have in our Bibles to Philemon. And in it he talked about Onesimus. He talked about the fact that Onesimus had changed. He said he was once unprofitable, but now profitable to you and me. Onesimus was completely changed. And it, Paul wrote in his letter, he said, I want you to have him back now. Not just as a servant. I want you to accept him back as a brother. I want you to have him back as if he is me. You respect me. You've got a lot of time for me. And I want you to treat Onesimus as if he was me. I don't know what Onesimus felt like as he carried that letter back. Philemon had every right to take him back and treat him as he deserved. He had run away, he had caused Philemon problems. But he went back with that letter. The Bible doesn't tell us what happened when he got there. But I think the fact that the letter is in the Bible indicates what did happen. I think Philemon read that letter. And you can read every word of that letter in the Bible. And I think Philemon did exactly what Paul said. He accepted Onesimus back. as far more than a slave or a servant, but accepted him back 
as a brother in the Lord Jesus Christ. Both of them have been forgiven by the Lord God. Both of them were equal in the eyes of God. And God saves men and women and boys and girls from all backgrounds, all cultures. And he saves us all to serve him equally together to follow him in the kingdom of God. But the question is, have we trusted in the Lord God? Or why are we like Anismus, thinking that to get away will make us happy? Don't be foolish like Anismus. He was graciously saved by the Lord God. But how much better to turn to the Lord God today and give the Lord God the best years of our lives to serve him and follow him in all our ways. Thank you again for the Sunday School lesson we've just heard. We turn now to our next hymn. And after this next hymn, we're so pleased to have with us today Pastor Roland Boas, and he'll be ministering the Word of God after reading a portion of the Scriptures to us. But first of all, let's sing our next hymn, Break There the Bread of Life, which is number 93. Break There the Bread of Life, dear Lord to me, as thou didst break the loaves beside the sea. Break there the bread of life. reading this morning is taken from the book of Numbers and the 10th chapter. We we'll read the first part of this very long chapter and then the latter part, missing out some in the middle. So this is Numbers chapter 10 and from the first verse. And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Make thee two trumpets of silver, of a whole piece shalt thou make them that thou mayst use them for the calling of the assembly and for the journeying of the camps. And when they shall blow with them, all the assembly shall assemble themselves to thee at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. And if they blow but with one trumpet, then the princes, which are heads of the thousands of Israel, shall gather themselves unto thee. When ye blow an alarm, then the camps that lie on the east parts shall go forward. When ye blow an alarm the second time, the camps that lie on the south side shall take their journey. They shall blow an alarm for their journeys. And when the congregation is to be gathered together, 
ye shall blow, but ye shall not sound an alarm. And the sons of Aaron, the priests, shall blow with their trumpets, and they shall be to you for an ordinance forever throughout your generations. And if ye go to war in your land against the enemy that oppresseth you, ye shall blow an alarm with the trumpets, and ye shall be remembered before the Lord your God, and ye shall be saved from your enemies. Also in the day of your gladness, and in your solemn days, and in the beginnings of your months, ye shall blow with the trumpets over your burnt offerings, and over the sacrifices of your peace offerings, that they may be to you for a memorial before your God, for I am the Lord your God. And it came to pass on the twentieth day of the second month, in the second year, that the cloud was taken up from off the tabernacle of the testimony. And the children of Israel took their journeys out of the wilderness of Sinai, and the cloud rested in the wilderness of Paran. And they first took their journey according to the commandment of the Lord by the hand of Moses. In the first place went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah, according to their names. And over his host was Naisha, the son of Aminadab. And we'll move on to verse 29. And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, We are journeying unto the place of which the Lord said, I will give it you. Come thou with us, and we will do thee good. For the Lord hath spoken good concerning Israel. And he said unto him, I will not go but I'll depart to my own ha land and to my kindred. And he said, Leave us not, I pray thee, for as much as thou knowest how we are to encamp in the wilderness, and thou mayest be to us instead of eyes. And it shall be, if thou go with us, yea, it shall be that what goodness the Lord shall do unto us, the same will we do unto thee. And they departed from the mount of the Lord three days' journey, and the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in the three days' journey to search out a resting place for them. And the cloud of the Lord was upon them by day when they went out of the camp. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. So reads the inspired word. May God bless his word. Our text this morning is taken from the passage that was read in the book of Numbers, that is Numbers chapter 10. And we'll just read together uh, at the beginning of our sermon, verses 35 to the end of the passage. And it came to pass when the ark set forward that Moses said, Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let them that hate thee flee before thee. And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. And we're looking uh, at this time when the people of Israel were setting off on their journey uh, across the wilderness uh, to the promised land. And in this uh, tenth passage, 10th chapter rather, just before we come to our text, there are several little interesting things uh, that are worth noting. If you go right back to the beginning of the passage, the second verse, uh, it talks there about these two trumpets, two silver trumpets, and uh, they're, they're mentioned in, in the verses just following. And they were used to, to get this vast a uh, company of people, uh, some estimated at around about two million people, uh, moving uh, and stopping at the right time. And we know that there was the, the fiery pillar uh, going before them, but there also seemed to have been the aid of these uh, sounds of the trumpets uh, in order to get everybody uh, in the right order and moving or stopping uh, at the right time. But uh, these silver trumpets, uh, it's interesting how they, they crop up in different places uh, in, uh, amongst Christian men and women. Uh, the hymn writers uh, refer to these silver trumpets. And you may know, I'm sure you do, that, uh, that lovely hymn, 
um, O day of rest and gladness, O day of joy and light, uh, that lovely hymn about the, the Lord's day. And uh, in the third verse of it, uh, it says, Today on weary nations the heavenly manna falls, again alluding to the journey across the wilderness. Uh, to, and then the next line, To holy convocations the silver trumpets sound. And uh, the silver trumpets of the call of the Holy Spirit to come and worship, I suppose, uh, is, is there. And it's interesting how the hymn writers uh, seem to be so steeped in Scripture, so knowledgeable of Scripture, so well-versed. They can pick up these various uh, allusions and weave them into their hymns. And that's always a mark of a, of a good hymn. And also uh, in this passage, just generally speaking here, um, we have the, the account of this man, um, Hobab. Um, he, he, you, you, you find him down in uh, verse 29. Uh, he, he, it says, And Moses said unto Hobab, the son of Raguel, the Midianite, Moses' father-in-law, and um, he, he meets them at this point. They come into contact with him. And uh, Moses realizes this man is very, very familiar with uh, the wilderness, with the desert. And uh, he, he wants him to come come along with them to, to join their journey. And um, he, he says to them these, uh, th these words, uh, come, come with us and we will do thee good. And uh, the, the implication as well is that uh, if you come with us and do us good, uh, we'll, we'll do you good. That seems to be the, the picture that, that we have here. And um, it, it, in one sense, it's a gospel invitation. Come with us and we will do the good. And that's exactly what happens uh, when we come into uh, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. Or you could apply it to the, the church itself. Uh, when visitors come or people come inquiring, come with us and we will do the good. And uh, people who join the church come to faith in Christ, of course, then they do the church good because we all come with our various talents uh, and capacities and abilities uh, and personalities uh, and so on. So that is, is, is a very nice picture. There's a little hymn that says, Help us to help each other, Lord, our little stock improve. Let each his friendly aid afford and feel his brother's care. Uh, and um, that's what we do when we come together in the things of God. So we may notice that just as we pass through. Also, we might uh, make a reference to the fact that the children of Israel, when the cloudy, fiery, cloudy pillar moved forward and the trumpets, the silver trumpets blew, they went forward. And when uh, it stopped uh, and there were various other blasts on the trumpets, they, um, they, they went forward and so on, according to God's purposes. And life is like that. And the history of the church is like that. Sometimes we're moving forward at a great pace. Other times we seem to stand still. But these are all, this is all part of the great providence uh, of God and the way God works. We are to be obedient to him. And when the call comes to go forward, we go forward. And when the call comes to stay, uh, hold the fort, to stand fast, uh, to be faithful unto death and so on, to stay at our post, uh, not to move, as it were, to the right hand of the left, away from sound doctrine and so on, we stand still. So there is a standing still in a sense, and on another, the other hand is moving forward. So we see that. Also, as we just come to uh, our text, we may remind ourselves that um, this isn't the only place in the Bible where these words are, are said. Um, you'll find them also in the 68th Psalm. I'm just turning to it now. Uh, you see uh, the first verse of the Psalm where it says, Let God arise, let his enemies be scattered, let them also that hate him flee before him. Now this Psalm, again we could spend a long time talking about this Psalm, so I mustn't go off at too much of a tangent here. But I, I will just mention that um, it's often said of this psalm that it is a, a superb uh, piece of poetry. 
you know, leaving on one side the great spiritual teaching and the great moral teaching, uh, just as a piece of literature. It, it, it is ex exceptional. Uh, some have called it uh, one of the, the masterpieces of the world's lyrics, one of the masterpieces of the world's lyrics. And I just, it just crossed my mind, you know, that the Bible's not taught in schools today as it should be. And just on the sheer, mere, as it were, level of, the, of the, the music of its words, the poetry of its expressions and so on, what a tremendous loss that is to the children and uh, young people of our age. Not only are they missing out on the spiritual teaching, which is uh, something exceptional, uh, not only are they missing on the moral teaching, which is the same, and they're also missing uh, on the great literary merits uh, of the scriptures. And we should do all that we can to encourage teachers and schools to uh, open the Bible and to teach it and to have it read and, and heard in, in our own day. But that was not really the point of turning to Psalm 68. Uh, what I was going to say about it is that the first part of the psalm is almost like a, a prayer, or you might even say a hymn of thanksgiving, because... Uh, David in this uh, psalm, sorry I can close the page again now, uh, David in this psalm, in the first part of it you'll see, is looking back, oh I should have said before that, this psalm is generally said that it was sung, written for the occasion of the bringing up of the ark into the city of Jerusalem, in this great a triumph as it were. The ark has come all this way through many dangers and many difficulties. Uh, it, it has been in the hands of the enemy at one point as you remember uh, but now it, it is coming back to its final resting place as it were in Jerusalem and so David is rejoicing in all the way the Lord has brought the ark and the way that he's led his people and preserved his people and kept his people and so you sing you see how he speaks about the goodness of god uh, he says uh, he describes god in verse five a father of the fatherless a judge of the widows is god in his holy habitation verse six god setteth the solitary in families he bringeth out those which are bound with chains but the rebellious dwell in a dry ground and and so on um, just go down to verse 9 for example thou O God didst send a plentiful rain whereby thou didst confirm thine inheritance when it was weary uh, and so on he's giving thanks so as he looks back uh, he, he sings or prays you could say his prayer of thanksgiving but he also looks forward and in uh, verse 18 particularly we read Thou hast ascended on high, thou hast led captivity captive. Thou hast received gifts for men, yea, for the rebellious also, that the Lord might dwell among them. And you can see that he's looking right forward to the time of our Lord's ascension. Our Lord's ascension to the right hand of the majesty on high. And so David is rejoicing, he's singing his psalm or song, uh, he's uttering this great prayer of thankfulness for all the way God leads his people and all uh, the way God uh, has triumphed over every evil and brought his people a great deliverance. So there is that connection uh, with the verses that we have here. Now we can imagine the scene here uh, as these people of old, these people of Israel, are gathering themselves together or they're gathered together and they're just about to uh, embark upon their great journey. And um, the, the passage, going back to the passage just briefly, uh, describes how all these folk are uh, put in the order of their tribes to go forward. If you go back to verse 14 for a minute, it says, in the first place, went the standard of the camp of the children of Judah. 
and um, then uh, it comes uh, the next behind them are the tribe of the children of Issachar and so on and then the tribes of Zebulun and so on all through the the, tri the 12 tribes uh, of Israel all behind their various standards and it must have been a tremendous uh, and wonderful picture uh, up, up here in, in the uh, black country they, they used to have these Sunday school processions I remember them in the north of England and uh, we, we resurrected them the last few years and it's a wonderful sight to see the Sunday schools behind their various banners uh, set off uh, to, to walk through the streets of the town um, it, and it just reminded me of these people of Israel behind their standards as it were marching marching forward uh, in order but the picture really is of um, this company of God's people moving, moving on towards the promised land. And that really reminds us that the Bible has this unique uh, way of understanding history. So what, what, what are you talking about? It has a unique way of understanding history. What, what I mean, Christians and the Jews of old and the Jews of present day, we believe uh, that history is, is linear. It has a beginning. It has an, an end. Uh, in the beginning, God made the heavens and the earth. And um, when you go to the book of Re Revelation, it talks of a, uh, a situation where time will be no more. The end of time. So there's a beginning of time and there is an end of time. And we know well that the, the world, the rest of the world, before the, the light of the gospel shone on it, before the truths of the scripture were opened in a wide way for all peoples, uh, the, the, many of their views of history were, were, were quite uh, different altogether. Uh, one of the most uh, well-known ones, of course, is the cyclic view of history which multitudes of people believed that there was no beginning and no end and everything was going round and round and round and round and, and what had been would come again. And so in, in a sense there's no progress. There's, there's a kind of a moving forward but you get so far then it goes back to the beginning. It's a very depressing and debilitating uh, view of history. It's why so many of these ancient countries uh, were so backward uh, and even the more advanced that never seemed to advance that far. Um, but it's a wonderful truth. Uh, it, it brings point, it brings purpose, uh, it energizes us, it inspires us uh, to think that, that we're on a journey and we're actually going somewhere. Uh, and if we're Christian men and women, we're going to heaven. Uh, and if we're not, we're, we're, we're going to a lost eternity. And these things are very, make us, are very solemn. They make us think, where are we going? And um, it has application, of course, to the fact that in the very centre of time, almost we may say, the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, uh, we have the BC and we have the AD, and he, he's there right in the centre. And... Um, in that ministry, the climax of that ministry, in a sense, was the cross. The great point and purpose of his coming was to die on the cross to make an atonement for his people's sins, to pay the price uh, of sinful men and women like you and me. And that great sacrifice, we say, was a once and for all sacrifice. One of the hymns writers uh, puts it like this, done and forever done, done and forever done. It, it need not be repeated. Now, if we were in some cyclic version of time, uh, well, it, 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 it couldn't be done and forever done because it keep coming round and round. But our sins have been dealt with if our trust in Christ and uh, they never appear again. They're, the sacrifice has been made, the atonement has been made, done and forever done. So these people we're on a journey and uh, so are we and uh, they're, they're on a journey and they are going to come to the promised land we know there is the judgment on those that rebelled and all that but eventually the people of Israel get to the the promised land 
and we as Christian men and women by the grace of God will one day get safe to heaven and God's purposes will all be fulfilled. What God purposes he fulfills and we sometimes remind ourselves that we're on the victory side. So, although at times it seems as if we're not and at times it seems we're going backwards but we're really always going forward. There are enemies on this journey and uh, you, you, you know about the various tribes that they had to fight, tribes that tried to oppose them, the, uh, the Amalekites uh, uh, and the Amorites and Og, king of Bashan and uh, the Moabites and all, all these sort of people that came against them. We always have enemies uh, in this world, but they get there and so, so will we. Now, this, this, um, these texts of ours, Rise, O Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, found in two places in the Bible, and they've been the great watchwords, or you might say battle cries, uh, of many uh, great Christian men and women in the course of history. Rise up, or rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. Uh, it, it is something inspirational. It's, it's a great cry, is it not? Um, John Knox took it up uh, in his day, and what a battle he had indeed uh, at that time. And just at this point, we might mention that with all the talk about um, Scotland breaking away from the United Kingdom, uh, John Knox was one of the great figures uh, behind the union of uh, Scotland with England. And he saw that as uh, something that would truly uh, advance and, and uh, safeguard the Protestant cause here in England. And uh, that should be remembered at this time. We hope the Scottish people don't break away. Uh, Oliver Cromwell took it up uh, in his day and uh, some of the great missionaries uh, have taken it up. David Livingstone, uh, his great uh, prayer, if you like, great ambition, godly ambition in life was, as he said, to build a road into the heart of Africa for the gospel, uh, even if it cost me my life. Uh, but he had this behind him. Rise up, O Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered, and let this great work uh, be done. Now, it's a prayer in the sense that it is in um, the psalm, and it is a, a battle cry in the sense, but it's also a prayer, uh, even here, in the passage uh, that we're looking at now. And perhaps um, we could just make that point that in the course of our Christian life and our Christian work, those two things need to be there. That is uh, the going forward into battle. Uh, Christ has gone before us, conquering and to conquer. Uh, and so are we. And there is a, a fight to be fought and a race to be run, and so on. Uh, in the Christian life, there is effort, there is energy, there is courage, there, there, there is uh, dedication, there is self-sacrifice, there are all these things that are part of the wonder and the glory and the duty and responsibility of the Christian life. You, you may know that hymn, we used to sing it in Sunday school, um, Rouse then soldiers, rally round the banner, ready, steady, pass the word along, all that sound the battle cry, see the foe is nigh, raise the standard high for the Lord. Well, that's, that's something we have to do. And uh, young people, I exhort you to, to do that in, in, the, in a Christian sense, to sound the battle cry against the um, enemies of the gospel and all those false philosophies and foes and those people that would uh, go against the things of God. But at the same time, uh, it's also a prayer and we can do nothing uh, unless the Lord is with us and prayer. I will for these things be prayed for. Uh, it's said, God says at the beginning, first chapter of the book of Ezekiel, and God in his sovereignty will do things with or without us. But in that same sovereignty, he has decreed that this or that will be done 
through the petitions and prayers uh, and labours uh, of his people. So prayer is a vital part of all these things. Now, the presence of God is with his people though. Here they are on this great journey and the fiery cloudy pillar and so on is the symbol uh, of God in the midst as the ark is also that same uh, symbol as they pass on. And um, we need the presence of God with us. I sometimes think some of our forebears in the Christian faith and you still come across people like this today they seem to be walking with God. They seem to have a sense of God with them, uh, a close walk with God in, in every aspect uh, of, their, of their lives. They, they, as it were, would never dream of setting out uh, in the day without prayer. Uh, they, they would see the hand of God in all manner of what we might call ordinary events. They, they would be seeking to, to walk and keep close to God uh, every day. And um, we need that. All for a closer walk with God is our prayer. And, and these people uh, were seeking to do that, certainly, uh, as we find them here uh, in, this, in, in this passage. Now, we may think of something else. Time is really running out. In one sense, this is looking at the, the great company of the Lord's people here. But we could also make this prayer, Arise, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered, a, a very personal prayer, because we have our inward foes, our inward enemies, and um, we know what they are. The, 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 sometimes we're beset with doubts and discouragements. We, we, we feel far from God. We, 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 we feel out of sorts spiritually. Now, this is a time to do battle with these kind of inward enemies. But if we do battle with them simply on our own, and, and all these battles uh, in the larger sphere of things and the, in, the inward things, uh, we do need to do that. But at the same time, we can only do it um, if it's the Lord helping us. Arise, O Lord, arise, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. We need the Lord's help to fight against these inward foes. But if we seek it, we will, we will find it, we'll know it. And you could look at it from a slightly different perspective as well. Um, there are people who don't like us. Now, you know, people don't like us. We, we perhaps have to do something about it if it really is our fault. But some people don't like us because we're Christians. They don't like the message. They, they don't like the whole thought. Uh, of Christianity and, and they, they vent their uh, disapproval on us and um, they may sort of uh, question our motives or, or this, that or the other. Uh, they may just upset us uh, and how are we to react? Well, another text says, uh, avenge not yourselves but rather give place unto wrath. Well, that's right. And if we could do that, we can also use these words, rise up, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered. The Lord will deal with these enemies and that's the best thing to do, really, not to avenge ourselves, but let the Lord uh, deal with these things uh, and, and he will. And, and again, you could look at it from the point of view that uh, we've been in Sunday school this morning, we've been in Sunday school. Uh, you, you have people who are trying to oppose that sort of thing or, or undo that sort of thing. You know, we're, we're teaching the children, the children are learning this, that, and the other good thing, and then there'll be other uh, influences coming upon them or other individuals coming upon them, and they're trying to undo uh, all these things. And uh, we could get very discouraged. We think that there is uh, uh, more with them than there are with us, as it were. But in actual fact, more there are with us than them. And when we do get discouraged like that and think, oh, our foes are too many for us. They are too many for us. But we can pray this prayer and find it is effectual. Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered and let them that hate thee flee 
before thee. And we've seen that time and time again uh, in the course of history. We must hurry on. Mr. Spurgeon, of course, is always worth looking at when we're preparing sermons. And um, the thing about Mr. Spurgeon, I always find uh, he is wonderful at always bringing us to Christ. Uh, that that's what every preacher should endeavour to do. And he's failed if he hasn't brought his sermon or into his sermon something of Christ or brought the climax of his sermon to Christ or brought people to Christ. That, that's where our focus must be. And uh, Mr. Spurgeon has wonderful ways uh, of doing that. And this is one of them. Um, he takes, talking about this text, he takes us to the time when our Lord lay in the tomb after the crucifixion. You know, um, crucified, dead and buried, the third day he rose again from the dead. But we're thinking of the day, as it were, that time, the Saturday between the Good Friday and the Easter Sunday, when our Lord lay in the tomb. He takes us there, and then he takes us to the, the time, the few minutes, as it were, just before the resurrection. And he pictures the scene of our Lord laying there uh, in the tomb, lifeless. And then uh, he gives us a picture uh, of the angel voices. I don't know whether it was like this, but you will see what he's trying to do. He, he's, he's, he sees the angels there calling out what they're calling out. Rise up, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. And then uh, the seemingly lifeless body of our Lord moves and is roused uh, and gets up and lays to one side in order the, the grave clothes and the napkin and so on. And then uh, the stone is rolled away and uh, the risen Lord comes out uh, conquering uh, and moving on to victory. And so it is, rise up, Lord, let thine enemies be scattered and let them that hate thee flee before thee as the guards flee in terror uh, on that first Easter morning. And so Christ goes forth into the world and then you see the great picture of uh, all those ancient cities uh, one by one coming under the sound of the gospel and idols being cast away and men and women being set free from the bondage of sin and death and the gospel spreading throughout the world rising on and moving on rather to the, the uh, ascension and the glorification of Christ and the final second coming of Christ rise O Lord and let thine enemies be scattered well, that's true. There has been a foretaste of that in another sense, even in the Old Testament, when the, the ark was captured and uh, taken into the temple of Dagon, you remember. And uh, Dagon's devotees gloried that they had conquered the God of Israel and they, they put the ark in, in triumph there before the um, idol Dagon and went to bed feeling very uh, pleased with themselves, but got up the next day, and there was the idol of Dagon fallen to the ground and broken. Arise, Lord, and let thine enemies be scattered. Well, we'd better come to the end, but we haven't said anything about verse 36, which says, And when it rested, he said, Return, O Lord, unto the many thousands of Israel. It's almost a picture of um, activity and rest, you could say. They, they go forth in the morning, as it were, and in the evening they come to rest. And um, you could see a, a, a picture there, can't you, uh, of daily life. In the morning we, um, we go forth to our work. Forth in thy name, O Lord, we go, our daily labour to pursue. Thee, only thee, resolve to know in all we speak or think or do. <clears throat> but I thought I'd close with the illustration of uh, Thomas Ken. You know, he wrote two hymns, at least, that are often remembered. Uh, one was about the morning and one was about the evening. The one about the evening perhaps is more well known than the one about the morning. <coughs> excuse me 
Thomas Ken was one of the seven bishops imprisoned in the tower uh, at the end, really, of the reign of James II, who was trying to reintroduce Roman Catholicism as the national religion. And uh, he, the, the bishops, he, he called upon the bishops to read a declaration of indulgence to Roman Catholics, granting them freedom. And um, there were seven bishops who wouldn't read it. They didn't read it. And uh, they were all imprisoned in the Tower of London. Um, in the end, uh, there was such a public outcry and uh, James ended up abdicating and the, the bishops were set free. But <coughs> Bishop Ken was one of them. And he wrote these two familiar hymns with which I end. You remember them when I say it, and you probably thought of it already. Awake my soul, and with the sun, thy daily course of duty run. Shake off dull sloth, and joyful rise, and pay thy morning sacrifice. We dedicate the day to, the, to God, and all our doing, all our business, all our relationships, we go forth to do the will of God. And then we come to the night time. And this is very familiar. Glory to thee, my God, this night. For all the blessings of the light. Keep me, oh keep me, King of kings. Beneath thine own almighty wings. It's a wonderful thing to lay down at night. And to know that God is with us. Um, we can sleep knowing that our sins are forgiven know that it's well with our soul know that we're on the way to heaven and the other verse uh, in that hymn of course is teach me to live that i may dread the grave as little as my bed teach me to die that so i may rise rise glorious at the judgment day we can sleep and not fear death and know that the lord our God is with us and will never leave us nor forsake us. And if we can think of something we've done in his name on that day, we might use the words of the poet, something attempted, something done, shall win a night's repose. If we can end the day saying, well, I did this, I resisted that, I uh, spoke here for the Lord, I did the, uh, this, that, the other. All these things enable us to sleep well at night knowing that God is with us. So we better end there and may God continue to bless us through the day. Amen. I'm so pleased that you've gathered with us this morning for a time of worship.
pray that what we've heard will be used by God to bless our souls and help us to advance in the things of the Lord. I would again encourage you each to like, share and subscribe to the channel and do of course pass on the details of this YouTube channel to as many people as possible that they may be blessed through the word of God. But now let's close our time in prayer. Let us pray. O oh Lord God, our loving Father, we thank and bless thee for the gift of thy holy word. We praise thee that thou hast spoken in grace and mercy. And we thank thee that thou hast caused thy word to be written down and preserved and brought to us and preached and set before us even at this time. O oh Lord, use thy word by the power of thy spirit that it might achieve great ends, great purposes in our lives. O oh Lord, bless each one of us, individually and as a body. Bless us, we pray, cause us to advance in the things of God. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Saviour, and the love of God, our Heavenly Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, be with each one of us, now and evermore. Amen.